If you enjoy listening to The Edge, support them by subscribing to The Edge on iTunes, Stitcher, and you can listen through the iHeartRadio app. Get busy listening. You're listening to The Edge with Mark Thompson. Hi, it's Mark. Thank you for joining us. Our guest is director Rod Lurie. His movie, The Outpost, is being insanely well-reviewed. And I saw it, and it's an immersive experience to see this movie. It chronicles a battle in Afghanistan at this outpost, which is in this valley. And the events that follow are true. And chronicled in the film, you see all of the ways that the armed services fail the soldiers administratively. And yet, these people are charged with defending this outpost. And we'll talk to him about Afghanistan, too. How are we there 19 years later? Also, Rod Lurie's interesting, not only as a filmmaker, but because he has a tie to West Point. So this is a really interesting conversation. I think you'll find it both intriguing and revealing. And so please enjoy it. In this age of COVID-19, I don't ask for money. Keep your money. But what I do ask is for your support with subscriptions and for five-star reviews. Just even a word or two helps keep us in the iTunes universe particularly. So critical. And now, without any further delay, let's get started. This is the edge. The advantage, it means. They look, I just spit on me for no reason. That's horrible. Is there some comfort in uncertainty, do you think? You're a degenerate. Because Australian shepherds need action. Wow. Yeah. This is the edge. That's a self-loathing term that I use. Oh, got it. Rod Lurie, the director of The Outpost, is here for the entire episode. Rod Lurie, everyone. Yay. Yeah. And Rod, you've got a great film. I've seen the film. So when I say it's a great film, this is not just me blowing smoke. It's a riveting look at a unit in Afghanistan. And I'll let you describe it. It was it's a real incident in Afghanistan that you've chronicled in this film. And you've been it seems slavishly loyal to the actual events of what happened. Well, slavishly loyal. Yeah, that's a uh, I think that's pretty accurate to say. You know, uh, there was an outpost that was put at the base of these three mountains, the Hindu Kush Mountains in Afghanistan. There were 50. Why why do they put it? That's one of the problems. And you introduced it early in the film. Like, this is the weird people who come into this outpost. It's called The Outpost, the movie. Yeah, uh, yeah. They, they go, <laughs> why are we here in the it's a, least right, strategic it's a place what, imaginable? It's a major what-the-fuck moment, right? And that's what all these soldiers went to, because most of them had to arrive at night at nighttime because the helicopters would be attacked if it was during the day, and Taliban didn't have night vision, so they arrived at night, and then they would wake up the next morning, and they would look up, and everywhere you looked, there were, like, really high mountains. And it's a major what-the-fuck moment, because they're going to be fucking attack. There's just no way they're not going to be attacked. And uh, they were attacked every day. They were the, you know, these units that were there would get these pot shots. And they all knew that one of these days there was going to be the big one, right? When hundreds of Taliban would descend upon them and try to wipe them out. And this movie is about that day, October 3rd, 2009, when the big one did come. The battle is, uh, I think it's rather impeccable in terms of its accuracy. The first hour of the film, we conflated times and characters just, you know, to be able to make a movie. But, you know, the battle itself, yeah, it's very accurate. So I want to talk to you about the situation with that outpost and you discovering this book by Jake Tapper, which chronicled the events that you then turned into a motion picture. How did you find this project and and how did it come to you and, and what happened? Okay, well, I will admit something a little humbling, which is I was not the first director on this film. I may not have even even been in the top 10, but by the time it got to, to me, Sam Raimi was the last person attached to direct it. You know, he, he's a great director. Simple Plan, the Spider-Man movies, Dark Man, all those films. And now he's producing the film. And I don't know why he didn't want to direct the film. I, you know, maybe he didn't think he could do it justice. Maybe he didn't think he had the experience. I, you know, I, I don't know. But he invites me in to his office. And I'm sitting there with Sam Raimi, and also with Sam is his head of development, this guy named Paul Merriman. You know, young guy, hustler type, producer type, and very smart. And we're yapping, and, I, and I'm really drawn to the story. I really want to make this movie. But I had another project that, you know, that I think the next day got a green light, and I had to go make it. And I made it. And a year and a half later, I became available again. But now Sam Raimi has stepped out as producer. This guy, Paul Merriman, isn't working for him anymore. And I believe is, I don't know what you would call it, uh, a going away gift. He gave him power over the the outpost. 
and um, came to me again. And this time they wanted to make a miniseries, and I thought, I don't want to do a miniseries, <laughs> but I will do it as a movie. And we brought it over to Millennium, which is a company, Mark, that basically does these really good entertaining shoot 'em ups but they're shoot 'em ups you know, the Expendables and Rambo and – but I think they want to branch out and to make some, you know, really, you know, strong, serious films. And we made a deal in the room, more or less, to make to make the movie. Wow, that's a great story. It's interesting that you mentioned shoot 'em ups because it is a war movie, but it's not like a yeah. It doesn't. It's, it doesn't have the. It's not a pure shoot 'em up war movie at no, all. In look, fact, look, I, I sat there. I sat there with these guys, and you know, and the thing I was trying to ingrain in everybody is there's a difference between an action film and a war film. They're two different genres. I mean, they both have guns usually, and they have explosions, I, I, you know, I guess. But, you know, an action film, you know, these movies are exhilarating, right? They're, you know, and my movie, you know, it's thrilling, I guess, in the battle, and it's, you know, I, I believe a really well-done battle, but it's more exhausting than exhilarating. And, you know... And it, and it's about real people, and it's about you know real men who died, and real men who got wounded, and real men who saved other other dudes, and you know and we have uh, an allegiance to the truth. And so I sat there at the Millennium offices, and I was telling them stuff that was not making them comfortable about how I wanted to make the film, like at all. And like I wanted to use vets to play a lot of the roles, real life vets, veterans, and I wanted um, to do most of the movie in these long oneers. Right, without any cutting, without any ability to edit down down the film, and you know that made them nervous. But, but to their credit, they played ball, and I think that they ended up happy with the end results. Well, it's a terrific film, and you get the tension of being in this outpost, which I think is actually maybe the real calling card of this movie, and it's played out in all the different ways. I say tension, maybe it's anxiety. I don't know what it is, mm -hmm. but it's an immersive film. You feel embedded with this unit, you know, the the outpost, and so in that you go, you know, you're kind of worried on the edge of your seat the entire time, and yet there's some sort of mundane things happening. It, it reminded me of a documentary called Restrepo, which is also about oh, an Afghanistan mm -hmm. unit, you know, in which you feel the tension even during these mundane moments and sometimes right. hours and hours and hours, days and days when it's mundane. Right. Well, you know, yeah, you know, and you never know when a bullet's going to come from the mountains. And in the case of this outpost, it came almost almost every day. You just didn't know when in the day it was going to come. You didn't know who was going to get hit, if anybody was was going to get hit. And you're right about Restrepo. Restrepo is a fucking great movie. It's, In fact, I'll tell you that the, the day before I left for Bulgaria to shoot this film, I invited the, the entire American cast to my house. I sat them down, and I showed them Restrepo. Wow. Yeah, and then I told them, get it, and I want you to watch it over and over and over again. This is, these are the guys that I want you to emulate. You know, you know, you, I don't want you to watch American Sniper. I don't want you to watch Lone Survivor. All that, you know, those are really good movies, but, you know, they're, they're not what I want to capture. I want to capture, as you call it, like a documentary style. So look at how these guys behaved. And that is a, you know, it's a, for, for your, you know, I want everyone that's listening to go and rent or buy on VOD, the outpost, but after you do that, you watch Restrepo. It, it's a, it's an absolutely um, superb film. There was a, I think that there was a, um, a sequel called Cornigal, which I showed uh, to the, to the other uh, cast members once we got to, uh, to Bulgaria, which is also really good. Well, this makes total sense then, because you really capture it. As, as I say, I've seen the movie. It was striking at the time. I thought, wow, this is a cinematic treatment of the feeling I had watching Restrepo. It, it, Rod has hit all of these different beats, and you have to do it in a much more compact, I think, challenging way, because you have a story and characters to develop and lay out. Now, you were chronicling this incident, so we right. know it's leading up to something, but man... And because you never know when the big one's going to come, and so, like, they could come when they're talking about a dog. They can come when they're talking about their girlfriend. You know, there's a scene where a guy, he's uh, jerking off to a photo of um, somebody else's wife and they get into a fight and they, the, the bulls can come then. I mean, you know, there is some episodicness to the, um, to the beginning of the movie and that's intentional because you never know when those episodes are going to be interrupted with some sort of hellish, uh, hellish gunfire. 
Yeah, but, and you know, um, when you're a viewer, you're going, is this it? Is this the thing? You know what I mean? Is it yeah. going to hit now? It's a, and, and that that times whatever incredible exponent, it would be what it would be like to actually be there. Well, I mean, they're always on edge over there. They always had to be in full battle rattle. They had to have all, you know, their uniforms had to be, you know, full of steel. <laughs> they had to carry their weapons at all times. And it, even when they had to go to the bathroom, I mean, it was it was terrible. You know, there's something else interesting about, about Restrepo and the, and the immersion that you feel in that film, and that is by its nature, because you got one guy with with a camera. You don't have Michael Bay out there shooting a documentary with 15 different cameras. There's, there's one guy with one camera. And so when the battles you see in Restrepo, he's following it with that one camera. And you never know if the camera's going to turn on somebody that's about to get hit. You never know, you know what's going to happen. And so I decided to shoot most of the battle on all the sequences in the battle actually in these extended runners, right? Where there's no cutting whatsoever. There's no second camera. There's no third camera. You know, it's it's not an action film, like I said before. And I was very inspired by Restrepo because that creates just much more tension. You've got this yeah. scene, right, where um, Caleb Landry Jones, who plays one of the Medal of Honor winners, uh, uh, Medal of Honor recipients, I should say, Ty Carter, and he's running across the entire outpost. And then he's running back, carrying a stretcher. And because we stay with him, we just know that at any split second, he could go down. Boom. And it's all over. And you don't know if he's going to make it. you got no idea. And, and I believe you completely forget you're in a movie because there's no cutting, because you don't see um, you know, any, any, you know, any, any funny business that usually goes with uh, shooting movies like this. As a director, when you're doing a scene like that, that, as you suggest, is so immersive, but is so risky from a filmmaker perspective, because of any one of these things that I assume you have to, you know, choreograph and rehearse and all these things that are going on during that one long shot. If any yeah. one of those things misses, oh, you got to start all over again. How, how does that? Mark, uh, how, it, yeah. it, it's a living. It's it's really a hell. <laughs> I mean, it's really difficult because one of the advantages to having all those cameras and doing so many different takes is that, um, you know, you can just fix everything in editing. And in this case, there's no editing to be fixed. You, you, you know, you need to get it right. And so, look, you got these shots where the guy's running 200 yards through bullets, right? So I've got stuntmen. I've got explosions uh, all over the place. I've got a cameraman who's got to, you know, keep up with the actor as he is running. Um, you know, and it, it's very specifically choreographed. And you're right. If any of these things go wrong, it's cut and start again. And sometimes you don't even realize you, that there was a mistake until the shot is over. So we just had to rehearse the living shit out of this stuff. So wow. Scott Eastwood breaks his ankle. Right, right before the shooting begins. Whole other story. It's a whole other nightmare. Oh my God! We, 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 well, after yeah, we, we'll get it, to that nightmare in a second. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, but it was terrible. It was awful. But what it did is, I, you know, I negotiated with the insurance company, and they gave me they pushed the movie two weeks. So I had the opportunity, Mark, now to really rehearse this stuff. And so not with the actors, but with the stuntmen. And by the way, there are no the actors are doing all their own thing. It was just a stuntman on, on you know, on the day of rehearsal that he would go through the motions and I would work with a cameraman and I would work with the special effects guys. We did it over and over and over again until we could be confident that we could do everything in two or three takes once we got to, um, you know, to the production. But there's another problem, Mark, which is the camera operator is going to be exhausted. You know, he's loving all this stuff. And so I designed something, or I should say Lorenzo Senatore, my DP came up with this idea where we're going to, disassemble the entire camera, have it like loosely hanging together. We put it in a backpack and we had a wire connected to the lens and my operator ran, just ran with the lens and carried everything else on his back. Oh, that's so, so yeah. cool. Yeah, it was really, so we found out that something like that had been done on Das Boat, the, the submarine from Wolfgang Peterson did a long well, time ago. Well, that was ago. years ago, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, you know, I don't know that it's really been done since, but it, it really helped us out. And, you know, this guy, his, the operator's name is Sasha Proctor, is a complete stud. And so 
But I'll tell you, the guy who really screwed us up the most was like uh, was Caleb Landry Jones, who was the lead, who was doing you know a lot of the running, and he would be. I mean, he was totally fearless. He was athletic. He was exhausted. He you know he played the part exactly right. But then he would like throw in in the middle of the shot or at the end of the shot some bit of improv where you know he hadn't cleared with me, and I had to you know, cut. Oh, for fuck! Or, what was that? Or, right, right. <laughs> or sometimes, sometimes I remember. Sometimes our we we had these two military experts, Jericho Denman and Ray Mendoza, and you know they'd be watching behind the monitor. And so, like we did these like magnificent wonders that would last a long time, and everything went perfectly, right? I mean, everything went perfectly, and we would all be high fiving and you know, and then hugging one another. And Ty Carter, who was with us, the Medal of Honor recipient, would hug us, and we totally nailed the scene. And then the military experts would come over and say, No, 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 no. This guy was holding the weapon wrong. This was fucked up. No, the oh clothes wouldn't look God. like that, you know. And I would say, Jericho, it's like a movie. And he, goes, and he would say, um, okay, that's fine. If you want every fucking veteran in America to look at this film and laugh at you, fine. Then leave it that way. And I said, okay, let's do it again. Oh, you know, my so. God. Well, I should say also, you have a little bit even more maybe of a sense of accepted responsibility, not only to do this all authentically because you want to as a filmmaker, but because you're connected to the military. You went to West Point. You have some yeah. ongoing connection, I assume, to you know people who know their stuff on the military. Well, I you know I graduated West Point in 84. I was an air defense officer. But I, 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 you know, Mark, I, I didn't serve in combat. I never served in combat. I entered the peacetime army. And um, I don't want to say there's guilt involved with that. It's, you know, it's not my fault that we weren't at war. But a lot of my classmates did serve and they were in the war zone. And, you know, when I go to reunions, when I'm hanging out with them, you know, I feel lesser because of that. And uh, because they've had this experience and I haven't. And it's the best that I can do is to make a war film that is about a war that they fought in or are fighting in. And um, there is a sp- responsibility there. You know, we also had responsibility to the families of the fallen in this in this movie to to get that right. And you know, it's a big weight on us as we are making this film. Well, the Afghanistan war, which has gone on 19 years, I want to talk to you about it in a minute. Kind of just right now, I want to talk about the filmmaking part, but then I do want to get into Afghanistan, yeah, sure. this war that's yeah, gone on sure. forever. But you mentioned Caleb Landry Jones, and for those who are listening and don't know, you might have seen him in, what, three billboards outside of Ebbing, that movie, and yeah. X-Men, yeah, right? He was, was he... thrown out the window, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He so he, um, you, you, you see these faces, uh, but even as I say that in Scott Eastwood, you know, uh, we know that his, his dad is, is Clint Eastwood and you know his face and you know his projects as well. But I, I guess what I'm getting at is you see these faces that you know and have seen in other films, but it's interesting because this is a combat film or you, it, maybe it's the environment or something, you sort of just lose them as regular soldiers in this dust-filled danger-filled environment. Yeah, it's, you know, and um, you, you just hit on something that I think is really kind of interesting, which is when you look at the other Afghanistan or Iraq films like um, American Sniper or a Lone Survivor or 12 Strong, these are all films about the Navy SEALs or the Rangers or the Special Forces, you know, and this movie is about these, just these regular Joes who are in the infantry. They're grunts. And we don't make movies about these guys. So sort of the ordinariness of them, the fact that they're not all, you know, these buff, great looking, you know, movie star types, which a lot of the SEALs in real life are, you know, and a lot of the Rangers are, was very important to me as I was casting this film. And, um, you know, a couple of the guys were sort of real men types, but most of them were not. And, um, and, I, and I think you're right. I think, we, you know, that's what I went for. That's what we tried to capture. Oh, it's, it's utter realism. I thought it's really striking. And you, just because you just, nothing jumps out of you is like filmmaking. It just all feels like a story that you're in the middle of. When you, I'm curious about this. And again, again I will get to the Afghanistan situation yeah, overall, sure. the reality of Afghanistan. But <laughs> okay, I want to, it's, know, it's really in, chomping at the bit. No, but it's intriguing it. to me. It's intriguing yeah. to me also to learn so much about filmmaking. You just even mentioned that, you know, there were other directors attached and then, or, or who, who yeah. were presented the project and they fell out. And this is always interesting to me. And then you talk about these uh, stars, you know, Orlando. 
Orlando Bloom and Scott Eastwood and all these guys. You have mm-hmm. to find a schedule that makes it work for all of them, as well as a schedule that works for all these other things that you want, cinematographers right. and a location and all yeah. this kind of thing. Yeah. No, I mean, that is, that is um, you know, the, the, the pre-production on a movie like this is obviously really difficult. And, you know, Caleb and Scott, uh, you know, they came in with a whole chunk of time. Uh, our contract with Orlando required us to get him out of there by X date. I think he was going on a big vacation. He had planned like for a couple of years with, or something like something like that. And he also had another project to go and do. I think maybe that part that he was doing on Amazon. So, you know, we're limited, um, you know, or constrained by, you know, by the schedules of, of many. And um, I had another issue over there. So Scott, Scott breaks his ankle and it pushes our movie by a couple of weeks. But that creates another problem for me, which is that the day is shortening in um, in Bulgaria. Every day that we wait, I'm losing another five or ten minutes in a day. And, um, you know, I lost an hour in the day by having to uh, wait on Scott Eastwood to heal. So it's like these are issues that nobody ever takes into account, but they're real. They're really real. Sure. By the way, just apropos of the broken ankle, I'm surprised that more people weren't hurt on this. It's a very physical film. Were there other injuries? There were no other injuries um, while we were making the film. You know, we were we were really careful. Although, you know, Caleb Landry Jones, you know, he, he was unnerving because, like, as I insinuated before, he's a bit of a freelancer. So when he's running across the outpost, you know, I know that there are divots anywhere. I know that there, you know, we want him to go a certain path. But he would break away from that path and just do his own thing. And, you know, and we thought many times that he was going to fall or get hurt. And, you know, at Scott Eastwood, you know, maybe he was doing stuff a little earlier than he should have as per the, the broken ankle. And I was just waiting one day for something to go wrong. In fact, one time we were shooting uh, one of the action scenes with Scott and I hear him yell out ankle, just screamed out the word ankle. And I thought, oh, fuck me. He's broken his ankle again, and the movie is over. But in fact, I think what he was doing is that he was warning somebody to watch out for the ankle. But everybody's heart dropped. You know, I, I, you know, you know those moments. <laughs> it's just split second moments where you think your whole world is gone. And you know, literally, if if, if he had hurt himself, the whole movie would evaporate. I mean, the insurance company would pay. We would all walk away, and um, all this work. Would have been for nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing. Thank God he didn't get hurt again. But you know. Yeah. You know, it's funny. If I were Scott Eastwood, the other thing I'd be doing constantly is just to mess with you. I'd be going up to you, going, "Okay, I mean, if that's the way you want to do it, it's not the way my dad would shoot it." But uh, you yeah. know. Well, oh no, no, no. That happened. Oh, believe me, believe me. I, I, I had heard. You know, a lot of the spawn of famous people do not like to invoke their parents because they want to be their own person. But Scott really, really respects his father and would often talk to me about, you know, this is what my dad would do. Yeah, he absolutely <laughs> did that. You know, it would be like, or it's a, you know, especially in characterization or in like how many how many words should I actually speak and, and so on. But, you know, I'll tell you something. I, I personally believe that Scott at the age of, he was 31 or 32 when he made this film. I think he's a better actor than his dad was at that age. You know, back then, Clint Eastwood was this unbelievable charismatic presence, right? And you saw on his face a life lived. You know, he did have that, and um, he's obviously a highly intelligent guy. But there aren't real breaths of emotion in his earlier performances. And I think that what you get the sense from, from Scott Eastwood in this film is this real love that he has and concern that he has for the men that he works with and for the wife and children that he has at home. And I, I don't know that Clint could have pulled that off, you know, when he was doing, you know, a fistful of dollars and the good, the bad, and the ugly and, you know, with, you know great films. But, you know, Scott's I mean, the a, bust, Scott's the bust on Clint Eastwood is just that. I mean, I'm not, you know, it's just, it's not even, a, I mean, he's a you know wildly successful actor for doing just this, but it's yeah. sort of now right. parodied, which is that, you know, that one-dimensional where everything's sort of a whisper like this, like, yeah, right. go ahead. Mm-hmm. You know, that kind of thing. That was sort of a style that he made work for him in all these different projects. But it's not as though that showed tremendous range. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, Clint Eastwood has become a very good actor. And I think that some of the stuff he did in Unforgiven and Million Dollar Baby and most recently The Mule, uh, you know, it's it's really, really strong acting. But he came into the artistry of acting, I think, a little bit later. 
look, movie stars play themselves and actors play other people. And, you know, that's a great line. Is that your line or who who said that? That's a great line. Rob Lurie said that, but I would, wow. you, I would amend that. Very it's impressive. Like, Very movie impressive. Stars play, movie, stars play, <laughs> <laughs> movie stars play the same person, I would say, over and over again. And actors play different people. You know, and whether it was the uh, Sergio Leone films or it was um, Coogan's Bluff or it was the Dirty Harry movies, you know, he was now he's a brilliant director. He's a wonderful composer. I think he's one of the great artists of, of our time. I'm just saying that Scott's a really good actor. And I think he must be. He doesn't. He tells me he doesn't read reviews, but if he did read his reviews right now, I think he would be rather taken aback by how much attention he's he personally is getting right now. It's really well, the, really yeah. The rece- reception of the on the film has been terrific. The film I'm getting this from Wikipedia holds an approval rating of ninety three percent. Yep, so and, far. And, it's really well thought of, and as you say, it's made can up I, of these wait, wait, great so can performances. I, I want to tell you something about this 92% stuff, okay, which is really great, and I'm really happy with this, Mark. Okay, we're really happy with the reviews. Like, the reviews come in from the Washington Post. It's kick-ass. We love it. Variety. It's kick-ass. It's great. Chicago, sometimes. Great. All that's great. And we go to – and, you know, we're not seeing any bad reviews at all. And we go to this Rotten Tomatoes, and I'm looking at – there's two negative reviews, or what they say is negative. And they're from the organizations that I have never heard of. None in my life, not for love, not for money, could I identify them. And, like, they're, they're ruining my 100%. Right, they're weighted the same. It's funny. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know how to make anything about any of that. I, I mean, the truth is that I can write a review, and it, <laughs> as you say, it has the same weight as some guy who writes for the Washington Post. I mean, really? I mean, come on. You know, yeah, you well, were a movie critic. You started that way. And you know that your depth of knowledge about cinema and history and what goes into making a movie, and then you know, as and then you try to review it just to someone who's going to the movies. There's a lot going into that mix of your review. Some other a hole who just has, yeah. you know, I just saw a movie. dot com. He writes something and it has the same weight as that. You know what it's like, Mark? It's like the Electoral College. I mean, like, how does California and Wyoming get the same two votes per senator? I mean, what the right. heck? that makes absolutely no sense to me. And that's, and <laughs> you know what? It's really funny. Like, I'm this adult guy. You know, I've, I've, I make these movies and so on. And for a couple of days, I sit obsessed with Rotten Tomatoes, keep refreshing it over <laughs> and over again to see to see what's going on. And I then I see there's another negative review there. You know, we only had two, but you're right. It's I just saw a movie. dot com. What you know? What is Texas Arts and Leisure magazine? Or yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it is. In the in in the meantime, we're getting this praise like from we got a great review from the New York Times, and, you know. And, and, but no, I'm uh, obsessed with you know the, these guys. I want to call them. I, I want to ring their well, necks, or I want to convince them that they're wrong. <laughs> uh, right, right. No, well, it's just like you know, and it, there's also something else, and it's just a human phenomenon. Probably there are few people who have thick enough skin. I mean more than a few maybe, but I find myself very sensitive also. Like, I'll read a bunch of stuff like, I love the show, love the show, love the show. Oh, my God, best show ever. Really enjoy it. And then I'll read one thing like, you know, can't stand it, you know, who are you, or whatever it is, and that is the one that will haunt me. I mean, I think there's also sort of a personal thing right. where you go, wow, well, what show did you hear? I mean, what did I say? Well, no, no, yeah, but i got to be really clear about this, Mark. I'm not, I'm not haunted by it I'm because I'm used to, I used to be a critic, so I know what we can be. I don't care about that. What I care about is the numbers. It's just, it's just mathematical, see. you know, it's just pissing me off, <laughs> you know, and I, no, you I, are, you are my, a much tougher cat than I am. There's no question about I'm that. I'm taking but. out my calculator and saying, okay, if we get one more bad review, it'll go down to this level. It'll take oh. this many more reviews to get it back up. And, you know, and it's, like, it's like, well, that's the other thing, you know, in the early going, it can be, and you can, you can be ruined that way in terms of the reviews. And I, now I, I'm glad you mentioned this because I want to ask you about releasing this film, which is so, as I suggested, all-encompassing of this outpost and this experience, mm-hmm. and it's anxiety-provoking and, and you know, tension-filled and exciting, and, and it's a true story. And you want to see it on the big screen originally, and now the big screen's right. not really available to you. Right. So, you know, we designed this movie, obviously, for the big screen. As, as you, well, you saw it on a big screen. I think we invited you to, yeah. you, you know, you were one of the special few invited to the uh, to the elite movies in front of an, in an actual yes. screening room. I felt like the and, special you know, few. Thank you. Well, yeah, you were. I mean, you, I, I put you in a room with James Woods, I think. And, yeah, that was the only um, thing that was a drawback, but go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> great, great, great actor. 
But you look, I I designed every bullet to fly over your head, and I designed this bullet to come from the left and that one from the right, and the sound of this explosion or the B one bomber and. You know the sound design was so specific, and I'm and I'm really hoping that my sound guys get their just desserts with year end awards. But you know you can't possibly get that at at home unless you got a really good system, which you know more and more people have. And we were supposed to premiere at South by Southwest, as you know, and then we're supposed to premiere at West Point, which is the first time that they would ever have done that. And then that goes away, and then we're going to have this big event from Fathom Events, six hundred sure. screens, and then that goes away. And so now we're in like 71 screens, you know, you know, like we are going to kick fucking ass in Wyoming. <laughs> it's going to be unreal. <laughs> right. You're saying those are the states that still have uh, movie theaters open, Wyoming. Even as you tell me this, I kind of get sad for you because what a tour de force this film is. And it was going to premiere in all of these inventive and uh, special ways. And now you're kind of cheated yeah. of that. I'm really sorry about that. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's a bummer. But, you know, look, people will be able to, to see it at home. I, you know, I was just watching uh, that movie on Netflix. I think it's called Extraction with um, Chris Hemsworth, a big action film. And, you know, I got a nice system at home and it, and it worked for me. But, you know, what I really want is for people to be able to see this film uninterrupted because when you're watching on your computer right which is the worst thing some asshole told me he watched it on his on his iphone which just killed me yeah. but when you're watching on your computer you're watching and then uh, an alert facebook wants to tell you something or an email has come in when you have dedicated a couple of hours to watching the film and you go into a theater or you go into your into your house in your screening room and you put your phone away and you say or watch this for the next two hours. That's fine. It's the distractions that also, you know, bother me of people watching at home. So when I sent this movie on a link to people, right? I sent it out to journalists, especially. I sent it out with a letter begging them to watch this the way, you know, to show a little respect and to to appreciate the film better. No, and, I think that's uh, right. You, know, you were saying don't watch this movie in between checking out Facebook alerts and other notifications or you yeah. know, taking a break halfway through to, you know, to get something from the kitchen. Right. Yeah, that, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying. And especially where people are going to discuss the film officially, I just want to make sure that it's getting its, its just desserts. And I really – look, there will be some theaters where it's safe to see the film. Like I said, we are going to knock it out of the park in Montana. <laughs> and uh, I, I got theaters in, like, and there are a couple of theaters in Washington State, and there are, you know, there's a theater in Connecticut that's showing it, you know, and there, you know, and so people should go see this from where they feel safe and where the health experts have said it's okay, wouldn't encourage it otherwise. But I really wanted to do the West Point one, though. That was yeah, exactly. As as you went down the list of things, that's the one that jumped out at me as well. Of course, you know. Look, Mark. If, if we're being honest, I was a completely shitty cadet. I was like the worst <laughs> cadet at West, at West Point. No, I was now, what does that mean, a shitty cadet? You weren't shitty well, academically, were you? Um, well, I, 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 I was. Maybe you were. <laughs> um, no, no. I'll tell you where I was. I, you know, I was. Like top of the class, if you were going to go just by my major, you know, international relations and the humanities. But once you look, I'm a, I'm a guy. I can't even screw in a light bulb, and I'm at West Point, and I'm taking uh, courses in thermonuclear engineering and mechanical engineering and physics. And uh, Edwin Teller was one of our professors. And wow. like, I'm wow. yeah, I'm complete, I'm completely out of my depth, Mark. And so. But no, where I was shitty is, you know, you can, you know, you know me, I, you know, can you imagine me parading and, uh, you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and all that stuff and keeping my room spick and span and, you know, and, and, and the, the discipline there was just not, not for me. And, you know, I'm, you know, I was, I was a better army officer than I would say I was a, I was a cadet. But look, at West Point, the academic schedule is like nothing you've ever seen, right? You wake up at 7 in the morning, or I'm sorry, you go to breakfast at 7 in the morning. Sometimes you're in class at 7.45 a.m., and you're, and you're taking class all morning, and then for most of the afternoon, and then you have to go do athletics for two and a half or three hours. Then you have dinner, and then you go to lectures at night. And I always dreamed that one day I would come back and I would stand on that stage in front of the 4,000 cadets for whatever reason 
And now I had my opportunity. We're going to do with this film. I was going to come back like like MacArthur to the Philippines. It was going to be a total triumph. And uh, it went down, went up in a puff of smoke. It's just so sad, man. Yeah, I can only imagine. And to be fair, it's not just some childhood vision or, you know, young adult vision. I mean, you have a lot to be proud of in this movie, The Outpost. And and I feel bad that, you you know, you were cheated of that just by by the events around this thing. Let's see how many people uh, see it at home. I am really, really gratified that um, the, the press seems to have responded this well to it. I'm really gratified that... You know, these actors are getting their due. The, the director of photography, Lorenzo Senatore, just like absolutely is getting a lot of praise. And the military um, newspapers and so on, um, the people that should be proud there are people like, um, you know, are my military advisors, a guy named Jericho Denman and Ray Mendoza and all my tech experts that, that were there. Everyone's getting their proper praise. And so, you know, that, that, that well, gives so, me I- a lot of comfort. I'm glad you mentioned the military. I want to quickly touch on this. Then we'll get to Afghanistan, and then we will, we, we've got to say goodbye to Rod Lurie. I mean, you, you're a big director, and I appreciate you taking time to talk to us. But I, the biggest, I, I, the biggest, I, the biggest. Yeah. I want to ask you about the military part because I want people to know this is not a glorification of war or the military. This is not a rah-rah film for the military at all, and it doesn't take a political view you know, it's not a liberal film and it's not a conservative film. I mean, you just mentioned James Woods is at the screening, love the movie. He's a he's a right winger. I was at the screening. You can call me a lefty and I love the movie. So uh, I, right. I, I think that it wasn't I, I like all those things. I feel as though those are all virtues of this film. It really recorded an incident. You know, you look at somebody like uh, like Jimmy Woods, who you're right, is very, is very conservative. And everybody follows his <laughs> Twitter account knows that. And you're. A well-known, uh, you're a well-known liberal, and yet the two of you had, uh, you know, and, and by the way, he's, as a human being, he's, a, he's, you know, he's this good dude, and you're this really good dude, and, but, uh, but you have diametrically opposing uh, political uh, opinions, and, and, um, and yet you guys had a community of emotion on this film. And that's what the really great films do. They create what I'd like to call a community of, of emotion. That's the other thing about not seeing – about the sad thing about not seeing this in the theater because one of the best things is when everybody leaves and they're in the same mood. And they go and you hear people talking about the movie and it's like a, it's like this beautiful bonding experience between people who don't know each other and will never see each other um, again. And – um, and that sort of has, you know, has, has you know, has gone away. So um, when we tested the film, Mark, you know, it's in front of hundreds of people. I hope I'm not speaking out of school, but um, there, there are questions that that are asked of you. And one of them is, where does this movie stand politically with you? Or does it stand politically? And we we had a... 100 response rate that it's completely apolitical and it is there's no politics in this film yeah i i I even would say that uh, as you look at the military and i was this speaks to the sort of the rah-rah thing that it's not necessarily just a rah-rah film you feel for these guys in the military who are subjected to sort of military bureaucracy all of these different people come in as commanders and you realize oh yeah it's not just one unit with one unified structure from a management standpoint, you know, from an administrative standpoint. They're dealing with all right. these cross currents when it comes to the military itself. That's right. That's that's right. And if if there is any sort of uh, any sort of expression of um, I want I guess um, anger or any sort of statement that's being made, it's more about. Um, the interest sign decisions that are made in the military and, you know, the fact that the higher ups really don't have much regard for what their actions are going to do to the lower downs. It's like paths of glory from that point of view. And the, you know, they put these guys in this absolutely insane place. They had their reasons, but the reasons were not good enough, in my opinion, to justify what they knew these guys would eventually have to go through. Or maybe they didn't know, and or they did know but didn't care, or maybe they just never thought about it. And you know that that's there's a, a cavalierness there that is, you know, it's a little bit upsetting. And I mean, the after action report on this battle and the investigation just absolutely reamed the people who created this outpost, reamed them. 
Does the outpost still exist? No, it was blown up. You know, a few days after, it was destroyed. It was, um, you know, this battle was fought. And although most of the men, the vast majority of the men, survived the battle, uh, eight, eight died, um, the, you know, the outpost itself was, like, completely aflame. It was um, physically destroyed. It became um, you know, sort of a, a semi-worthless. And so, you know, we, we destroyed it, and we destroyed all its assets, I, I believe, like, on October 6th or October 7th of 2009. Now I want to talk to you about Afghanistan itself. and mm, uh, Beautiful place. I, you, you have you've chronicled this, this situation in Afghanistan, which is a microcosm of everything going on there. 19 mm-hmm. years America's been involved. Prior to that, Russia was involved, and then countries before that, you know. Right, and yeah. it's become, a, it's become a, a proxy war place, and it's become, it's just a, yes. it's, a, it's a hornet's nest on top of a swamp. I mean, use whatever a parallel you want. But why are we still there? <laughs> uh, well, you know the answer to that, which is we shouldn't be. But I, but I, but I will tell you this: that in World War II, if you asked every soldier why are you here, they would all give you the same answer, right? Why, Mark Thompson, were we in World War II in the uh, on the European side? It's pretty simple, right? I think I don't know what you I don't know if they'd all say the same thing, but I think that the they idea of you know, there to stop Hitler, we're here yeah, to stop, well, Hitler. stop yeah, the fighting for freedom, yeah. fighting fascism, whatever it might be. Yeah, we're fighting Hitler, we're fighting fascism. You know, this guy's invading the world. We're going to stop this fucker, right? That was the um, that was. If you ask every soldier now who was in Afghanistan, why are you there? I guarantee you, different answers from everybody. And or if there is a common answer, it's I don't know. I don't know. And we have that moment in the film where the guy says, do you know what our mission here is? And he goes, I don't know, sir. You know, we're just there to fight. I, Ty Carter, who uh, received the Medal of Honor, he was on a panel with me yesterday. And um, he basically said, you know, we're, we were just there to survive. And that becomes the mission. And, the, and that's the tagline of the movie. The mission was survival. I was listening to a talk radio show years ago, and of course, this thing's been going on, as I say, for almost 20 years, and yeah. the caller was calling in about something related to, he had just gotten back from uh, Iraq, I think it was, and the host said, well, thank you for your service, so we really appreciate you, you know, risking your life for this country, and he mm-hmm. said, with all respect, I wasn't risking my life for this country, I was risking my life for the guy next to me. That's right, that's exactly fucking right, and, you know... The that is exactly 120 percent. No, I'll go thir- further. 130 percent correct. That is the top you percentage. Know? 130 percent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 130 percent. And look, everybody who died in this battle died trying to save somebody else. That was it, man. Every time that they shot a Taliban, it wasn't well. That's one. That, that's one more for democracy. It was one less guy that can kill my pal or can kill me. And the brotherhood there is really un- unbelievable. I can tell you from having not served in combat, but, ha- but from having served with these men, that it is this kinship that is the most dominant force that you can use to defeat the enemy. That's the practical nature of things on the ground. But from a U.S. policy standpoint, American presence in Afghanistan is truly bizarre to me, and it's bizarre to anyone who looks at it. And so you now have deals being made by the Taliban that you, as you say, you know, you just alluded to it, uh, we were trying to vanquish and are trying to, we're fighting them, we're also making deals with them. And I understand that's how deals work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in Vietnam, the same thing, you were fighting uh, North Vietnamese, and at the same time, you're trying to sit down at the the peace talks and hammer something out. Mm -hmm. But we also try to install a government, and they're not even part of the entire peace talk uh, strategy. So you see sort of the absurdity of everything in all of these different moments. And then you get to the bipartisan nature of support for the war in Afghanistan. In other words, it's spanned Democratic and Republican administrations. Look, in the the beginning, it made a lot of sense to go after those groups or the group that aided and abetted in the um, in the 9-11 attack. But we are far beyond that at, at this point. And it, this was exactly what the, the people who were opposed to the war, like, for example, Obama or Bernie Sanders were, were saying right from the start, that the quagmire we're going to get into 
is the quagmire that we are absolutely in right now. And getting out isn't that easy, Mark, as you know, as as you well know. It's um it's like a bad marriage. It's much easier to get in than to get out of. Divorce is messy and maybe it's too expensive, and, you know. And, uh, right. And, and well, in this case, I mean, know. in this case, I guess, I mean, the arguments are, well, you'll leave a void there that'll be filled by fill yeah. in the blank, you know. We can, McCain said when he was running for president, we may be there for hundreds of years. And it's like, whoa, really? Right. You know, and that was, and, a, that uh, was a moment know, of honesty. It was a moment yeah. of honesty. And it may have even been a little bit of clarity because... You know, it is, this is very, very, you know, difficult to just, you know, to just sort of walk, walk away from. And, you know, and, you know, I don't want to get into the current politics with the current, current president, but let's just say that maybe this thing can be resolved in the next four years. Well, I would certainly hope so. I mean, there are, as I suggested, there are bipartisan relationships with this war that defy logic. So uh, it's not a, it's just a sad, it's a sad situation regardless. But I love this movie, The Outpost. I would hope great things for you, Rod Lurie. I mean, meaning I I hope a lot of people see it. I hope they see it in some way that can allow them to be part of this immersive experience that you've created. So I would encourage, you know, however, yeah, I'm really so proud of you and really... uh, Glad you got this done, and I hope uh, I hope good things happen. So, uh, Thank thanks you, for coming here, and uh, and go see the outpost, Rod Lurie. Yay! Go see the outpost. You don't even you don't even need to go see the outpost. You can stay and see the outpost. Uh, yeah, that's right. Hope you enjoyed Rod Lurie and the conversation with him, and appreciate all your feedback and your five star reviews. You can. Find us at edgewithmarkthompson at gmail.com if you want to reach out in any way. Edgewithmarkthompson at gmail.com. And until next time, bye-bye. Oh, okay. Let me, okay, yeah. Let me just, yeah. It's just something. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to thank you for all the ways that you support my friends on the Edge podcast. And if you haven't already, why don't you show your support and subscribe? What's the matter with you? Go to Edge Show. Oh, it's Edge Dash. What the, what's with the dash, stupid? All right, let me. I want to thank you for all the ways that you support my friends on the Edge podcast. Edge-show.com. Stupid. Why is there a dash? Get more of The Edge on Stitcher and iTunes or go to our website, edge-show.com.